as it was foretold, I saw strange creatures ride forth, as if from the ashes of the old motors. They seemed part machine, part flesh. A strange new breed, ready for their ascendancy. It's a popular view of the future. A future after fossil fuels have all been depleted. An apocalyptic wasteland dotted with rusting wrecks, memorials to our short-sightedness. Imagine a world without motor vehicles. Civilization as we know it would grind to a halt. Well, there's one group of people that take a slightly lighter view of the situation. Put it this way, if we're all motoring down the road to ruin, well, they're going under their own steam. If you're ever in Northern California in spring, you might chance upon them. Strange convoys of contraptions trundling along country lanes. They are kinetic sculptures works of art that move, fueled by nothing more than human sweat. Every year in Humboldt County they hold the kinetic sculpture race. Three days traversing treacherous terrain, pedalling across land and sea. 1995 marks the race's 26th anniversary. And the person who instigated all this Californian craziness, artist and all-round tinkerer, Hobart Brown who, a long time ago, lit a fire in the locals which just won't go out. We like the little quiet people that work in their garages and never get noticed. We like those kind of people. And we give them a life. In fact, we make being a loser really a success. Potted history. It's 1969, and Hobart Brown decides he wants to improve upon his young son's tricycle. After an all-night tinkering session, he emerges triumphant with this, the pentacycle. Young Justin Brown is far from impressed, but there are two ways of looking at it. Whereas Justin lost a tricycle, the world gained its first racing kinetic sculpture. Why he did it, not even he can tell you. But it caught on. Others started raiding backyard sheds and cannibalizing bicycles. In the beginning, the race was just a quick wheel down the main street, a curiosity. Who could have known that a quarter of a century later, Hobart Brown's kinetic sculpture race would bring tourists flocking to Eureka in their thousands. Well, now I'm all excited, I'm ready. <laughs> in a nearby workshop, sparks are flying. The wacky racers are building the latest batch of wheeled wonders. And with the race just around the corner, being a manic mechanic is a full-time job. Why do you do this, Ken? Why do I do this? What's the attraction? <laughs> well, I think it's mostly a lot of this personal challenge. Yeah. See, see whether or not you can design something that will do all the adverse conditions put before us. Yeah. And it's a lot of fun too though. If these people are successful, they'll compete in the greatest competition known to man. This engineering will not only look artistically wonderful, but they'll cross sand, mud, two miles of water, and endure highways and everything. So this is the ultimate competition. There's no greater contest than this and what they're going to do, the total human being experience. You know, as a reporter on this program, you quite often get to do things which transcend the everyday. I'd have to say that riding along a country lane in a six metre lobster with a silver armadillo helmet on, well, it's different. Let's face it, Salvador Dali's moustache would have even twitched at this sight. Beneath the carapace, kinetic technology is providing for a surprisingly smooth ride. But then again, we haven't yet hit the H2O. How are you going, Duane? Every sculpture has to be dunked in the drink as a test. My sinking feelings were buoyed by our crustacean's buoyancy. As for the others, well, some took to the water like, well, pretty much as you'd expect. The fly floated. Others started okay, but... Sinking! 
Such is life behind the wheel of a kinetic sculpture. And behind the whimsy of it all, this is the kinetic moment, right? A deeper message. Our message here is we're having a lot of fun showing how human powered vehicles can actually do all kinds of tasks, impossible tasks, and still be successful, still be useful, and, and can also solve some practical problems that may exist in the future. It's kind of dumb if you build a car that burns wood and you only have two trees. So we're dealing with something we will always have. As long as the Earth is, and we're on it, we're going to have human power. So why aren't we using that source? Why are we exercising in our bedrooms and then driving to work? Not many people get to change things on the scale Hobart has. Those who have joined him on the road less traveled have learned about self-reliance and ingenuity. They're also learning to think more about what might lie up around the bend. 